Welcome to this month's edition of the Agricultural Market Situation Outlook presented by NDSU Extension Agribusiness. Uh, my name is Dave Ripplinger. I'm an extension economist uh, with a group uh, and the moderator of our monthly webinar. Uh, this month, we have kind of a, a little bit of a shorter stack. Uh, Frain isn't here today again, so we, we do have a video from him. Uh, then Tim with Livestock Markets, uh, Ron uh, covering crop budgets, and I'll talk a little bit about E15 uh, to close things up. If you do have any questions, uh, feel free to use the Q&A tool or the chat tool if you prefer. Uh, we'll get to those at the end of the presentations. With that, I will try and turn it over to Frayne. And if I have any difficulties, please let me know. Hi, I'm Frayn Olson, crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm tra uh, traveling again this week, so I won't be able to join you live, but I have prepared this recording to try and give you an idea of what I see coming out of the um, WASDE report or the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates information that we got yesterday. So let me share my screen li really quickly here and I'll get my um, PowerPoint up and running. So here's my count. Uh, contact information. And if you do have any questions that you think about later that you'd like to try and visit with me about, I'd be happy to do that. I have my email address as well as my work cell phone number. That's probably the most reliable. Feel free to call or text if you have anything. So let's begin with the information about U.S. ending stocks. So the March WASDE report or the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates really weren't expected to see any major changes and shifts but it, which, which is what we got. We, we, there were some minor adjustments here and there, um, nothing really significant to, to make it have any major shock value, especially for old crop uh, inventories or old crop uh, pricing. So the row on top highlighted in blue or bolded in blue is the average trade estimate. So this, the, there's a survey done just before the WASD comes out every month. Um, this is the average of the trade estimates, what they were expecting USDA to report. We also have the highest trade estimate as well as the lowest trade estimate to give you kind of an idea of the range of, of how, how, um, how much consistency or how much differences do we have in opinions at this stage of the game. The highlighted black line towards the bottom is the information we got last month. And of course, the very bottom row highlighted in red is what we got out of this report. So usually I like to compare what was the trading expecting to see versus what we actually got. Um, so again, not major shifts or adjustments. Uh, let's start with wheat. Um, actually, USDA left all of the numbers for wheat, both the production and the consumption side, identical to last month. So if you compare the February numbers with the March numbers, you'll see they're exactly the same. Um, the average tra trade estimate was looking for a little bit higher inventory numbers. I, I think primarily because of the expectation we might see a slight cut in uh, exports uh, from the USDA, but that didn't really happen. They had basically the same numbers as we had last month. For corn, um, they were expecting a slight increase in ending stocks. And I do think a lot of that, the expectation was to see some change in the export numbers. Um, but we got a little bit larger decrease in exports than first expected. So when you compare USDA's forecast last month versus the current forecast, there's about a 75 million bushel cut in exports. And that has been a challenge for us. I've talked about that before. Um, when we look at our export pace today relative to what we saw this time last year, we're pretty, we're pretty well behind what we were. And again, we haven't seen that picking up yet. I think we might see a little bit more uh, export pace as we get towards the end of this marketing year, but again, we'll have to wait to see. On the soybean side, again, they, you, the average trade estimate was looking for a slight increase in ending stocks, which is what we got uh, a, a little bit. Um, oh, excuse me, uh, a slight increase. We actually got a slight decrease. I apologize. Um, and, and most of that decrease was actually a combination of a, a, a slight decrease in crushing, but a larger than expected increase in exports. So, so crushing from last month to this month decreased a little bit. The exports were increased. So we had about a 15 million bushel increase in consumption, which then took the ending stocks down. And that was, I guess, if anything, a little bit of supportive news for the soybean market. Now, probably the bigger piece of information and the thing that more people are, are more focused on right now 
is what's happening in South America. And first, let's look at the Brazilian numbers on the far right-hand side. We have a column for corn, a column for soybeans. Once again, the blue highlighted is what the trade was expecting to see out of the USDA. Um, the highlighted black numbers on the on the, towards the bottom is what we saw last month. And of course, the highlighted red is what we saw this month. So for both Brazilian corn and Brazilian soybean production, you know, really the average trade guess was pretty much right on what we were seeing last month. They didn't expect any significant changes um, and we didn't get any. So right now the Brazilian crop is almost half for soybeans is almost har halfway harvested. Um, corn is split into two, a first crop and a second crop. So we're still trying to estimate both, both crops simultaneously right now. But really the, the weather coming out of most of Brazil is in pretty good shape. They, in fact, they have had some rains recently that have slowed the harvest progress for soybeans, which is raising some questions about how much second crop corn or those that double crop corn will actually be planted. So again, we're watching that, but for the, the this year's corn crop as well as soybeans, no real change. The bigger news has been what's happening in Argentina for both corn and soybeans. Obviously, the soybeans have probably gotten a little bit more attention than the corn has. Um, when you look at what the average trade estimate, the blue numbers versus the numbers we actually got, USDA did cut those numbers a bit more than what the trade is expecting. Um, and, and when you compare um, what we saw last month, uh, corn at 47 million, um, million metric ton and soybeans at 41 million metric ton, this cut down to about 40 million metric ton on corn and 33 million metric ton on soybeans was a much bigger adjustment than I think most of the traders were expecting. However, to put that in context, um, just like, you know, as we get into drought conditions here in the U.S., USDA tends to be a bit slow to adjust their, their uh, yield estimates down because what they're doing is they're making a yield estimate based on the information they have today with the assumption that the weather forecast will, will, contain, will continue uh, uh, at normal. So we're going to looking at normal weather from this point forward. And of course, a lot of the private NS are, are saying, well, if we're in a drought right now, like in the case of Argentina, they are in the basically the third year of continuous drought. The expectation for a lot of the private forecasters is that that drought conditions will continue. So there's a difference in expectations or kind of forecasting where USDA is thinking we're going to have a, a typical average weather forward because that's what they're assuming in their forecasting versus a lot of the private guys are saying, well, we think that the, the uh, drought will continue. In fact, yesterday, the Rosario uh, Grains Exchange, which is kind of the major grain exchange in Argentina, came out with their revised forecast for corn and soybean production out of Argentina. And their best estimate right now is that there was about 27 million metric ton of soybean. So USDA is at 33. The Rosario uh, exchange is at 27. And for corn, the Rosario uh, exchange is at 35 million metric ton with about 40 coming out of USDA. So there's a lot of these um, outside forecasters, both private as well as now in, in, in Argentina. They're actually looking at it and looking at some very much smaller numbers than we've seen in, in quite a while. And so as these numbers keep changing, the markets are watching that very closely because that impacts. Um, obviously, the ability of Argentina to be able uh, to export both soybeans, soybean oil, and soybean meal, because Argentina does export most of their soybeans, as well as corn, because typically Argentina is the third largest corn exporter. So this has an impact on both corn and soybean and the export potentials we have, have here out of the United States. I would also like to touch just a little bit, make a few comments um, about 10 days ago or so, about two weeks ago almost now. Um, the USDA had their outlook forum. And so this is kind of the first time that USDA puts forward some expectations or forecasts for the new crop production. So notice the column on the far right hand side in red is for 2023-24. That's the crop that we'll be planting this next spring. The column in the blue is the current forecast that we got in March now for the old crop corn, 2022-23 marketing year. I'd just like to make a couple of comments because I, I get some questions about this. Probably the, the thing that, that people were watching the most, marketing analysts were watching the most was, what's the expectation for total production? 
And for corn, obviously total production, we're taking planted acreage, we subtract out some corn silage, and then we look at what the trend line yield is. So right now, USDA, as well as a lot of private forecasting, our fact forecasters are using a trend line yield as their baseline. So think of, again, the trend line yield, that's an average yield, long-term historical average yield, but we've adjusted for better farming practices. The science of agriculture is getting better. So look at this 181.5, and, and I've heard some comments. It's like, well, USDA is forecasting a record corn production next year, or a, at least a high, a record high uh, corn yield next year. You know, that's true. But again, you got to think about this trend line that our average yields are increasing every year a little bit. And so even though that looks like a pretty strong number, that is the mathematical average when you make it make these adjustments. So if you look at total production, given about a two and a half million acre increase in corn plantings from last year into this year, with this trend line yield, the, the idea is we're going to have a production uh, size or crop, a corn crop, about the same size as we had in 2021. And we drop down to the bottom line and we look at usage or potential consumption. Again, this is all mathematical forecasting at this point, where the, the current thought is we'll have uh, consumption levels that are a little bit lower than we, what we saw in 2021, which then would lead to slightly higher ending stocks. Now, um, ending stocks is a percent of use that's not extraordinarily high because uh, our usage numbers are still pretty strong, but it is at a higher level than we see today. And so again, the thought process right now, kind of the mentality in the market is that we're really right now planning and looking for a larger crop in 2023 than we had in 2022, and actually something similar to what we had in 2021. For soybeans, um, they were, they're basically saying flat. We're not going to see any increase in planted acreage. Now, there's a lot of private forecasters that are saying we might have like a million, maybe a million and a half acre increase in soybeans. But based upon USDA's projections, we're going to have about the same plantings as last year. You plug in a trend line yield at about 52 bushels per acre, and you get a production total production number that's a little bit higher than what we saw in 2021. I mean, not dramatically higher, but very, very similar, a little bit on the higher side. Well, total consumption, you know, total consumption is going to be nearly identical to what we saw in 2021. Re again, very good, strong export pay, strong crushing demand. So the, the thought process right now, again, is we'll have a slight increase in inventories, again, assuming that we have normal weather conditions. And then finally, looking at wheat. Uh, not a big surprise in the wheat numbers. Um, there's about a little over a three and a half million acre increase in wheat plantings, uh, total wheat plantings. Most of that we already knew about because of the winter wheat seedings report, where um, a little over three million acres of that increase is just from winter wheat only. Um, when you back calculate that, it, it, the implied number is that we'd increase spring wheat plantings about a hundred thousand acres or thereabouts, and so pretty close to what we saw last year for winter wheat seeding or for spring wheat seedings, but with the increase in the winter wheat side. When we look at total production, um, again, if we can get a trend line yield, we've had a couple of years now in 21 and 22 where wheat yields have been hurt because of weather. If we return back to normal, we'll have a, a slight increase in the production numbers. Uh, again, a bit higher than what we've seen over the last two years. When we look then at total consumption, USDA is forecasting a slight recovery in our export pace. And, and again, domestic consumption being very stable. Well, increased production, consumption staying at about the same levels. We're, we're looking at, a, at an increase in inventories uh, again rebuilding some of those inventories that we've been hopefully been able to take down over the last couple of years. So just to summarize, the expectation for corn, soybeans, and wheat is that we're going to have, a if we can get good yields or average yields next year, that we will have an increase in production, that those will lead to higher ending stocks, that will likely try and take prices lower as we move into the summer months, as long as we have a good production season. We really won't know um, more information until the March 31 perspective plantings report. Again, we'll have an update on that later on. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop and stop sharing and come back and say, well, thank you for listening. Again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to try and answer anything you have. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Frayne. And with that, we'll turn it over to Tim. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Tim Petrie here, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Again, like Frayne, my contact information is shown there, so feel free to uh, get a hold of me if you want to. Uh, we're going to talk just about cattle prices today, and uh, a lot of positive fundamental factors have been occurring the last several weeks, or this entire year actually started last year. And so uh, I'm going to mention some of those as we go along here and look at the charts, starting off with Fed steer prices. And uh, I'll just kind of, I've mentioned this before, but uh, since it's uh, kind of a new year here, just show you the color coding. Usually I leave uh, the last two years on the chart and then go to the current one, but I did leave the uh, uh, four years back, 2020, because the COVID year, just to show how bad it was due to the pandemic and prices and then also how much we've recovered so the uh, red line is going to on that's on, going to be always on the top is what their prices are doing this year and then the blue line is last year 2022 the purple line 2021 and then the green line is 2020 so uh I'm not going to go into history very much because we want to know what's going on now and then what's into the future. Again, the the blue line there and kind of in the center, we had, uh, you know, increasing prices throughout the year last year, about $20 higher than the previous year. And so uh, positive things in, in motion. Uh, a lot of things going on there. Uh, Prices went up in spite of record high beef production. And so uh, export demand was also record high and domestic demand was good and maybe better than we thought it was. So, uh, you know, even though we had record large uh, beef supplies, we were able to uh, increase prices there. So again, let's go to this year and the red line there. And we started off about 20 bucks higher than last year again. And, uh, and have moved up nicely here in, in the last month. Uh, exports have backed off a little bit from uh, their very record high level last year, but domestic demand is good. The beef cutout uh, has been last week was up to 290 and that is even higher than last year. So that again uh, means beef is moving. Beef production is, is down. Uh, because of, you know, last time I talked about uh, the uh, inventory report that come out, the fourth straight year of cow liquidation, that means we've got less cattle and and uh, and going to have less calves this year and less fed cattle. And so, uh, you know, the lower supplies are positive. Beef production has been down uh, so far this year, about uh, close to 5%. Uh, not only fewer cattle, but uh but the lower slaughter weights as well, as packers are, have to get after cattle when we have fewer of them. So uh, those are, you know, all positive things that uh, are affecting the, the market. So, you know, we last week, uh, on, this is on a, the five area market on a live basis was up to uh, 165. That is, as you see up there in the upper left hand chart, that's the highest prices have been since April 2015 on a weekly basis. And so, you know, the talk is uh, that uh, beef production is going to go to the USDA right now is predicting almost 6% lower beef production for the entire year. And uh, that's coming from a couple things. Yeah, we have, we'll have fewer fed cattle and uh and there have been a lot of heifers in the mix and uh, you know we've got some better weather now so it's assuming maybe that that some of those heifers will be held for replacements instead of going into the feedlot and then the other thing on beef production is is again we expect lower beef cow slaughter this year it was a very very historically high last year because of the severe drought by the end of the uh uh in November, 75% of our cow herd is in drought, and we've seen uh, a really nice improvement in a lot of places, not right from, uh, you know, Kansas and Nebraska and up here is still dry, but but have seen enough improvement where there might be interest in keeping heifer calves back and would, would keep them out of the chain. So anyway, uh, looking ahead then, uh, the red squares there are the futures market uh, contracts that are trading for the uh, 
the rest of the year and then next year. And so uh, uh, again, looks like we're going to do close to $20 uh, higher than last year and do a more seasonal trend. Usually fed cattle prices go up into April and then back off into July when the big uh, calf uh, run are, are fed out for the, the calves from the previous year and then go back up at the end of the year. In the last couple of years, they have not went down much in July because of just uh, recovering from COVID and so on and getting restaurants back. They've just kind of marched up and so. But anyway, at, at, uh, at really at historically high prices. The average uh, price for the year in 2014 for uh, the, this uh, chart here, this five area fed cattle uh, was 153.84. And uh, so uh, again, that's the annual average. We got up above that by the end of last year. And this year, you know, again, we're at 165 now. Uh, USDA, Frayne mentioned the WASDE report that just came out yesterday, and the WASDE uh, USDA is predicting the annual fed cattle price now at 161.75. Uh, those uh, five futures contracts still trading. If you look at the average of those, this is yesterday's close and they did back off a little bit or, or it looks like they're going to buy the close here of 50 cents or so, but still pretty close with average 164. So uh, the indications are that we will have a, a all time uh, or a historic high on fed cattle prices this year, if those futures hold and USD's prediction holds. And again, we're again, have gonna have less beef production. The export market's got a hold and domestic demand's got a hold. There are some question marks uh, there. And so we'll have to wait and see. And then cyclically, again, we expect higher prices in 2024 with uh, fewer uh, fed cattle to sell and up probably another $10, which would set you know, uh, an, another record there. And uh, on a kind of interesting, on a weekly basis, the all time weekly high back in, in the end of November in 2014 was 171.38. That was the highest weekly high. And so, you know, the futures are saying maybe by the end of the year, we will be, uh, th th these are, this would be uh, at the end of December, their December futures would be close to that or for sure up there by 2024. So higher fed cattle prices are certainly positive for uh, feeder cattle and uh, particularly the more distant months, whenever, depending on what weight we're talking about, when they will finish and be fed steers. And so uh, the feedlots look at that price and then what can they pay for feeder cattle? So again, these higher futures prices are supportive. We go to the lighter weight calf prices, uh, same color coding there. And again, uh, last year, the blue line there, we had about a $30 throughout the year improvement over the previous year. Again, we had a smaller calf crop, which was supportive. And uh, although corn prices were relatively high, we had a, a, a nice rebound there. And then this year, uh, several things coming into play here. We've seen a really, really nice seasonal increase. Usually calf prices do go up kind of peak in April or May when there's that peak demand for grass calves. And there aren't a lot of 550 to six weeks to sell. We have more 758 and so on. And then they usually kind of level out. And then, you know, over there, if you look up from the middle of October, October 15th is usually the seasonal low. And, you know, we all have higher prices this year, but on a seasonal basis, they uh, very well could be lower in the middle of October than they are now if the seasonal pattern holds. But anyway, why the increase in calf prices, one, it's those fed cattle uh, futures that I talked about that are higher. And then on the other, uh, I didn't bring the drought monitor this time. The drought monitor just came out today, but we've seen a really nice improvement and uh, in areas. And uh, for instance, uh, you know, going south, the, the uh, summer grazing uh, starts. And so uh, the Appalachian states were very dry, Kentucky and, and, uh, and Tennessee have a lot of uh, cattle, about the same amount, just a little less than North Dakota has. And, and so they are completely drought free. Missouri, you know, when we're moving 
up from the south and in Missouri is drought free, Arkansas down in that area uh, and the uh, eastern side of of uh, Kansas and even Oklahoma and Texas that were dry. The eastern side has gotten rain. The western side is still dry. Uh, a lot of improvement up through the uh, the eastern slope, uh, you know, uh, western Colorado and up into Montana, it's, you know, through Wyoming is, is drought free now. And then another big one is California. You've probably been seeing the news a lot of improvement in California from severe drought to now they actually have too much rain. And so that's really, the, the grass has really sparked the calf market. And then the other thing, of course, it affects calf and feeder cattle prices are corn prices. And um, Frayne didn't really show you the futures chart this time, but uh, corn prices have dropped in the last month about uh, 60, 65 cents by the day, I guess. And so remember the old adage, change corn 10 cents, change feeder cattle a buck in the opposite direction. So corn going down and, and, and grass and so on, and those higher fed cattle futures have been positive. And, and then fewer numbers, again, have a, probably about a million fewer calves this year than last year. So all nice supportive uh, prices. And so we expect them to, uh, again, uh, continue on higher than last year, but that doesn't say that they won't go. They, they still will probably go down in the fall when the big runs hit, but you know, better calf prices to deal with. Go to the heavyweight yearlings, kind of the same uh, story here. They were up $20 last year uh, throughout the year. And again, seeing a ni nice uh, spark here, particularly in the last month, uh, uh, and how much they're above last year for those reasons I just got through talking about corn uh, going down in those fed cattle futures. And so for the rest of the year, those uh, red squares then are what the futures market is uh, indicating and uh, just continual improvement. And usually the seasonal high in these would, would be, uh, you know, more kind of like in September, uh, and and uh, into that, but the future just keep going up, mainly based on those higher fed cattle futures. And then that uh, that uh, we, we you know we've got fewer of uh, fewer of them to sell. And so uh, there again, our all time seasonal or our all time annual high uh, here for these are North Dakota prices now. The the all time high was uh, two hundred and eight dollars in 2014 that would be the annual average and so uh uh you know we're starting we're below that now down there at a uh, little over 195 but by the end of the year the futures are up there at you know 224 225 and so again by the end of the year at least we will be uh, at at uh, near record high prices, but since we're starting off lower and started off, at, you know, at 175 or so there at the beginning of the year, probably won't meet a, an annual average, but again, up there. And then we're trading the gold then, we're trading a, a 2024 futures January and uh, yesterday at right up there at, at uh, 223.24. So again, looks like better prices there, but the Fed cattle futures have to hold and, you know, uh, Frayne just mentioned, and that's something we really need to watch here on feeder cattle, is that uh, March 31st planning intentions report, uh, that is survey based. And, uh, you know, he, he mentioned that the USDA's prediction for more corn acres and all that at the outlook for him, but that was just their guess, as he said, with with average uh, yields and so on. So planning intentions, the acres report will come out and that could sway the market some way if there are fewer acres than, than what was he was showing there on the WASDE and, and then we'll have to watch corn and does it get planted and how many acres and, and so on is, would be the big thing we need to watch on feeder cattle, but now again, look positive. Here's last week's market report. Couple of things. Uh, these are for the markets in North Dakota that uh, USDA AMS reports, and that's Napoleon, Mandan, and Dickinson. So, just a couple of comments on there. Uh, on the left are steer prices, and on the right are heifer prices. And so, go to the left on steers, for instance. I 
just use this average price in my charts. And so, you know, people tell me, oh, I got, uh, let's look at the 550 to 680. I, I get 250 for my calves or whatever. And, and, and yeah, we, we see a wide ranger uh, last week, same weight and grade of calves at those three markets that are in the same geographic area right down I-94. 211 to 250 there, but the average is 232. So that that's uh, what I use. A couple of other things, of course, and and maybe too late for this year, but whatever it uh, you know the the thin cattle are bringing really nice premiums, but on the other hand, the fleshy cattle are really being discounted because feedlots want to buy them uh, you know with uh, thinner so they can put compensatory grain or the same thing on the lighter weight ones and so when you're background in cattle you know corn is is really even though it's went down 60 cents or more here in the last well corn is still relatively higher when when you put it in the bin or so on so you know got to be careful that we just don't feed them too much and get them a little bit fleshy because you take a, a discount on there and then you pay high feed costs. Well, the same thing down on the 750 to nines then, or the 750 to, to 800, uh, average of 195.28, uh, some selling better than that up to 205 and so on. So again, a good market and, and fewer to sell this year all falling into that. Go to the right-hand side, Kind of the same story on heifers with the fleshy heifers and so on. One comment I do want to make is, you know, there is optimism there. And, and uh, you see replacement heifers bringing uh, premiums to their to their lesser quality or whatever uh, our counterparts and up almost at steer prices. We're selling last week, we're selling replacement heifers at, you know, $1,400 to $1,500 a head there. And that's for heifers that we got to keep till summer and breed them. I hope they get bred, keep them a whole nother year before they, we hope they have a calf. And so there is optimism there. I've, our, uh, our uh, newsletter just put in a plug for that is supposed to come out I think today we just finished up it's a little late and I just talked to Brian and there my column uh, in that this week is more on replacement heifers and what are what's our chance of herd rebuilding and and so on so just keep that in mind go to call cow prices again uh, usually they do go after bottoming out there at the end of October, November every year, then they re usually do spark this time of the year and they're doing it again this year, just up really nice. Again, we've backed off uh, 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 some on uh, beef cow slaughter. Last year is very, very high beef cow slaughter. Now with at least the Eastern state and, and, and uh, California and so on, getting some rain, we backed off beef cow slaughter and, and you know, hamburger selling very well as well. So that's uh, sparking the cull cow market. Again, these, this average here is for these 85 to 90 percent lean cows. These are our thinner cow would be broken mouth cows that had a, uh, a calf on them last year. And and are probably just eating hay this year. And so again, up in the upper right hand corner, producers tell me, hey, I'm I'm getting a lot more than what your chart so is my cows. And yeah, I agree. Or, you know, we're selling $90 or even well over hundred dollar cows for the, you know, the higher dressing and higher yielding cows and so on. But this is just the the uh, sort of the USDA price that I get here for the Northern Plains. And for the other ones, you know, the trend is the same going up and we expect that to continue this a year too. And depends on how much it rains and the more it rains, the higher they're going to go because the less cows that were, that'll be sold. So with that, I'm going to quit and we'll uh, turn it over to Ron. Uh, Ron Hogan, uh, Extension Farm Management. Uh, there, this is my contact information if you have any questions for me. Um, I'm going to talk to uh, talk today about crop budgets. We have released our crop budgets. Um, another headline, kind of the same as last year, uh, NDSU projects, projects profits. Uh, the profits look good again this year, yeah, yeah, even though we have a lot of high expenses. Um, the, the commodity prices are high to try offset that. And, uh, and so we do these budgets by crop and by region. And just remember now that these are just a guide. Every situation, every farmer situation is different, uh, but people wait and wait till we come up with these budgets because they want to have something to compare to. Um, now, remember now that the, the bottom line to these budgets are return to labor and management. 
Uh, some of the crops that we that we do budgets on are a lot more riskier than others, and we don't really take that into account in our in our projections. And the return to labor and management it, from an e economist point of view, anything above zero is good, but you've worked all year and you, and you haven't paid yourself anything, which happens some years. And the, you should get paid for your management. And a, a rule of thumb is you should at least get paid 15% for your management. So that's the, that's the bottom line, the way we calculate our budgets. We break the state down into nine regions. Um, the, these are probably based on the soil, I mean, uh, based on the uh, yields and the, and the field operations that are done in the area. Um, so, uh, so there's nine different, but uh, nine different regions, and we do up to 20 different crops in each region. Some of the regions have 20 crops, so there's a lot of number crunching to do. Um, generalizations that I can make: uh, costs, of course, remain high. Um, most crops in all regions have profit, like it was last year. On a negative note, the input the input costs are historically high, historically high if you look way back. Now, fertilizer prices have gone down some, um, but they're still historically high. And uh, for, for this 2023, we are gonna be applying normal fertility levels, normal, uh, 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 normal application rates because the fertility levels are, are closer to nor normal. Um, so it's generally about the same cost per acre as a year ago, uh, our year ago projections. Uh, a year ago, we were coming off the 2021 drought and so the application rates, we, we reduce them. Pesticide prices have, have increased for most a little bit, but the big one, the big use, uh, big use uh, chemicals, Liberty, uh, Roundup, those prices have gone down. So it's generally about the same cost on a per acre basis for your chemical costs. Now, as we all know, uh, fuel is up. Uh, in our uh, in our budgets this year, we 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 uh, we researched uh, and called around to various uh, various uh, fuel suppliers, and we came up with a price of three ninety for a projection for the twenty twenty three year. Uh, seed prices are actually flat to down a little bit for small grains and soybeans, and they're flat to up some for corn, uh, sunflowers, and canola. And then the big thing that went up is interest rates. A year ago at this time for our projections, we were doing four and a half percent for an operating loan. Right now, the calculations that we did, seven and a half percent. That adds five or six or more dollars per acre in interest cost if you're borrowing all of your money to put your crop in. We're assuming a six month borrowing period. Fertilizer, uh, actually, potassium was up a little bit, um, and uh, nitrogen and phosphorus were down. Crop insurance um, uh, was up a little bit, uh, just because the losses we've had in, in North Dakota, uh, things are up. Most people take the enterprise units to try reduce their premium cost. And of course, with all this inflation we're having now, uh, we've got machinery costs going up quite a bit. Um, so that's reflected in these budgets and also uh, in the same line, so is repairs. And then when farmers are making profit, uh, the, the, the landowners want, uh, want, want to get some of that. So we've got rents going up as well. Here's a typical budget, that, the, the way we, way we uh, uh, do our budgeting. Uh, I just picked East Central North Dakota. And you can see this is a soybean budget showing, and we're using 12 and a quarter for our market price for soybeans. The yield we use is, our, is a seven year Olympic average for the region. And you can see that there, there's the estimated market revenue. This is the easy part. Uh, 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 and then, uh, and, and, uh, and after that, then things are a little more, more um, uh, um, guesses on, on what things are, but we try our best here. So we've got the seed and the herbicides and the fertilizer, not much, too much fertilizer on, on soybeans. Um, and you can argue about any of these numbers, as I mentioned, any of you, any of you uh, producers have different methods and different rates and different ideas, uh, but, but it, this is our projection, kind of an average for the region. Um, you can see here, the overheads have gone up, the, the depreciation and investment has gone up, and the rents have gone up as well. 
So at the, the bottom line is a return of $108 an acre, which is pretty, pretty darn good. And you can see this is how it breaks out the direct costs of $5, a 562, 343 for indirect costs. Indirect costs are anything that you're going to incur those costs, whether you plant one acre or not. Okay, you're going to have those costs regardless if you plant anything. And then the direct costs only are associated with when you do plant a crop. Uh, the total cost is $9.05 uh, $9 a bushel. Here uh, in the East Central, here's the crops that we uh, projected. Um, we do have some negative crops, oats, dry peas, and flax. Um, maybe because we maybe picked a price that was a little low, um, we try our best to, 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 to pick that, but those actually showed up negative and may not be negative for your own situation. Uh, especially crops like mustard, way up there. And there's some really good contracts for mustard, but it's a very risky crop and it probably isn't, can't be grown in a lot of places. But I, and uh, so that's why the specialty crops usually show pretty well, but just bear in mind that they are, are riskier. But everything looks like a pretty fair profit in 2023. Those were the dry land budgets, as I mentioned here. Uh, these are only a guide and uh, make sure that that uh, it don't just go by those specialty crops that we have in our list of crops. Here is the, uh, the uh, website where you can get those budgets. They're on the extension website and you can download them. They also are available in hard copy in all of your county extension offices. We also did some irrigation budgets and we broke the state down into three different regions. I'm gonna talk about that just a little bit here. I'm just showing an Eastern region here. This is an alfalfa budget. Alfalfa usually does pretty well under irrigation, uh, looking at a six ton and $120 price. And we've got the, and this is an established uh, established alfalfa uh, field here. And uh, you can see the various fertilizer and the irrigation repairs. Uh, they are calculated by Tom Shear, our, our egg engineering on staff, egg engineer on staff and those are calculated by him. So we incorporated those various costs on the direct and the indirect into our budget. Our bottom line shows $138 or $96 a ton to grow alfalfa in Eastern North Dakota. Here are the crops that we looked at, wheat, soybeans, barley, dry beans, silage, corn, and then alfalfa seeding is the establishment year where you probably wouldn't make much the first year. Um, and then the alfalfa budget, as I demonstrated. Dry beans look very good under irrigation. Um, uh, wheat, uh, wheat's never been really great to irrigate. It shows a little negative there. And here's where you can get those budgets. There's our website um, uh, and, and you, it would bring you right to it. It's on our website, just go and grab those. We also have a tool called Crop Compare. Uh, now this is just for the dry land budgets for the nine regions. And this is to kind of compare the, 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 the direct costs of the various crops that we budget. And here just shows you a snapshot of what it looks like. Let's just say you picked soybeans and then you pick a price. You probably wanna pick a, pick a futures price and then subtract the basis to get the price. And then it compares soybeans, let's say, to all these other crops and comes up with a, with a relative price. So if you, if you think you could, uh, you could return over variable costs are two twenty five per acre for soybeans. You'd have to have nine dollars and eight cent wheat to to do the same thing, okay? Or canola, you're going to have to have thirty thirty uh, cents, thirty point four cents. And so it just kind of compares things. But one thing to remember then is that you, uh, you're comparing crops, just the direct cost and not the indirect cost. And yeah, uh, and you 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 if you have a lot, especially a crop that you need some specialized equipment, you can probably include that uh, increase your 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 um, miscellaneous cost to kind of override what we have in there. Anything in the yellow there, you can override our numbers, and that's available on our website as well. Um, uh, just remember uh, that this is just a few uh, a tool for producers to for changing scenarios until you finally decide on what to do. Here is the, uh, the link where you can get that crop compare. And with that, I will turn it over to David and he is gonna talk about um, E85 and we'll take some questions at the end. Great, thanks, Ron. Get going here. 
Yeah, so I just have some really brief comments about uh, what's being referred to now as Midwest ethanol E15. Uh, so this is coming about in response to a petition by eight Midwestern governors who asked for a waiver uh, from EPA allowing summer sales of 15% uh, blends of ethanol. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, maybe EPA did come back and did uh, agree with this. They have proposed a rule that would allow that summer sale. Uh, unfortunately, it wouldn't begin until next year. Uh, and that's led to a little bit of turmoil uh, within the biofuels industry because they were anxiously anticipating this uh, coming about. Um, there will be a hearing uh, later this month to discuss it uh, with regard to that rule. You know, it's important to note in the last few years, we have had E15 available uh, across mu much of the country, if not all of the country. Last year, uh, the Biden administration had a emergency waiver uh, due to fuel supplies, which allowed it uh, during the Trump administration, they had changed the rules before they were overturned, allowing sales of E15. This is essentially the next go around and kind of an interesting way to uh, address, you know, the, the availability of ethanol, uh, especially in those states, again, in the Midwest, who are, are predominantly the producers. I just wanted to talk about a couple of things. And I bring this up pretty regularly. Uh, for, for folks to realize that we really don't use ethanol as a fuel in this country. We use it as a fuel additive. You know, ethanol is used uh, in gasoline almost all of the time for its octane, not its energy content. Uh, and that's really important uh, because when priced against other octane alternatives, it's, it's very low cost. Uh, and at the same time, we, we do see this across most of the United States. Almost all the gasoline sold uh, is E10. Uh, here's just a quick little chart app happens to be from RFA, the Renewable Fuels Association, that shows uh, the different octane ratings uh, of these sources. Again, you can see ethanol kind of to the far right there uh, with an octane rating of 114. And the idea is, and what we saw uh, you know, about a decade ago, is this transition to gasoline blend stock dropping to a 84 octane. And then in any given market, you could... Uh, you know, blend uh, with any, all, some of the for a consumer. Again, that blend stock would be available uh, to those blenders and those additives, whatever they might be, uh, you know, combined prior to, to taking it to the retail station. And again, you can just look at that. Well, you can see that ethanol is much higher, uh, but of course it's, 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 you know, you're looking at this in terms of price. And so here's a chart uh, that from U.S. Grains, and they have a consultant who puts this out uh, pretty regularly. And this is a chart over time of the price per gallon of ethanol and BTX, which is uh, uh, those other uh, uh, common additives. So benzene, toluene, xylene. And you can see for most of it, that, that, that orange line is lower than the blue line. Uh, in, in most cases, buy about a dollar a gallon. So if you think for a dollar less, you're getting much more octane, you know, the, the, the obvious economic choice is to uh, use ethanol as your fuel additive. And again, this is not necessarily what people think. Uh, you know, people oftentimes think that, you know, ethanol still gets a tax subsidy, uh, that it's you that you have to use it. Uh, and that's really not the case. Uh, and, and, and in most cases, the biggest driver of ethanol use uh, is that it, it's relative affordability as a fuel additive. Of course, when you go to E15, things change a little bit. Uh, this chart is just about MTBE. That was the dominant source of octane uh, prior to the RFS. Uh, it, just before uh, ethanol took off with the RFS, MTBE was having a lot of issues in states with uh, contaminated uh, facilities, essentially leaking from uh, gas stations, tanks, wherever they might be. And so ethanol provided a nice uh, solution to that. But MTBE is allowed in many states still. But you can see for most of this time series that ethanol, again, is, is less expensive uh, than that octane source. Finally, we can talk about ethanol as fuel. That's where it gets a little bit interesting. Again, as a consumer, you typically be looking at that relative price per, per unit of energy. Uh, and again, ethanol, as we all know, uh, has, has less energy than gasoline on a volume basis, about two thirds the amount of energy. Uh, but there are times where uh, it might be priced as such where it is a lower cost fuel. As that kind of comes along too, and we look at issues like E15, 
actually had the chance last week to visit with a group uh, of of importers from across Latin America. And they had a lot of questions because they don't use ethanol uh, in many uh, Latin American countries. I mean, obviously Brazil is a major exception to that, but they had a lot of the same questions that uh, the US did over the last 20 years in terms of how, how do you actually get ethanol to market? Uh, how, how does it work with all different parts of the system? So they brought up things that we've been through, including, you know, what's gonna damage your vehicle and you know, unless you have a very, very old vehicle, the gaskets and fittings are fine. Uh, a lot of a lot of automobile uh, manufacturers have not included E15 in their warranties until recently, and some still don't, uh, which is is somewhat important to note. I don't think I don't think the risks are great, uh, but again, that is something to always check. One of the things that definitely comes up for consumers too is, is fuel efficiency. You know, especially now with a tight economy. You know, what are you actually getting in exchange for your dollar? You know, how much further down the road can your vehicle move? What can it haul or tow? You know, is an important consideration. Uh, the one thing we don't think about, and which is critically important, and is kind of the driver of this, is emissions. And so EPA is charged with overseeing uh, our, the emissions, uh, the air emissions associated with, with, with fuel use. And so they did, you know, years ago, do a lot of studies and, and then, you know, basically made a, a decision, a, a rule that any vehicle after 2001 could use E15. Now, it's important to know what this means. It means that the emissions from those engines meet the standards that they have for emissions, not that a given uh, auto manufacturer is going to warranty it or that there might not be other issues. And it's also the same thing, too, with the read vapor pressure the thing that most folks don't 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 worry about you know it's it's a major concern in the summer having that that rebate pressure level at a certain at a certain point does in, impact how much uh emissions are released from a vehicle again something we don't typically think about but it's something that's really important and something under the purview of EPA um that's what i had for just some quick comments about uh this new midwest e15 which we might see this summer We'll probably see next summer. I think you probably also see a lawsuit uh, in, the, in the coming months, uh, depending on how fast things go. But that concludes our prepared remarks. Uh, we do have time for questions. If you'd like to use the, the, the chat or the Q&A tool, uh, we'd be happy to field those. Of course, we all shared our contact information. You can reach out to us at any time. Uh, right now, I don't see any questions or chat, but I'll definitely give uh, the audience a minute to, to think of any that they might have. And then of course too, if, if it, Ron or Tim, if you have anything you wanna add uh, as we have a little bit of time, you're definitely welcome to do so as well. Yeah, I'll just kind of follow up on Ron and he kind of mentioned it to me, but make sure you know on those budgets, uh, there are spreadsheets and so you can put your own numbers in. That's right, isn't it, Ron? Yeah, I guess I failed to mention that. Uh, you can get a hard copy, and then there's also on, on our website, we have an Excel files for each of the regions, and then you can pick your crop, and then you can override any of the, our numbers that we have in there. Yeah. And, we, and we do have one question, uh, which I, I'm going to say is for refrain. Uh, is there any update on Mexico and the non-GMO corn issue uh, for the next year? Um, I'm going to leave that. I don't know if Ron or Tim, if you have information on that. Obviously, it's been a, a point of contention uh recently between our countries they are a a major market for a number of agricultural goods uh and this this gmo issue is uh is a pretty tough sticking point but i don't have i don't have any updates on that yeah and you can definitely email, definitely email frame um that, that might be that might be the best way you get a hold of him it's still the, the winter meeting season and so he's out and about and instead of playing phone tag and email email could certainly work yeah, there are discussions going on daily with Mexico, and I I don't follow it either, but Frayne does. But uh, you know, we're we're threatening some uh, some trade agreement issues and so on, and and, the, and meetings are going on all the time. So Frayne is up on that. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us today, and the other two presenters, and for Frayne for for taking part in today's webinar. Again, we will be back in a month. Uh, happens to be on Thursday, the fourth. Uh, excuse me, Thursday the thirteenth uh, in April. So hopefully by then all of the snow has passed and we have flowers growing, uh, but maybe not. Uh, but with that, I want to thank everybody. Hope you have a great day.
Bye.